But what did happen here domestically was an anthrax attack. And that was sort of one of the wings of uh, a propaganda that the Bush administration was leaning on, that Saddam Hussein had this vast biological weapons program and these massive stockpiles of anthrax. You're listening to The Corbett Report. Welcome, friends. This is James Corbett of CorbettReport.com. It is the 19th of October, 2016 here in Japan. And today we're going to be talking to Robbie Martin, a filmmaker who should be familiar to my audience because he has been a previous guest on The Corbett Report. I'll put the link in the show notes for this interview. Today we're going to be talking to him about his work, on not only on his uh, documentary trilogy, A Very Heavy Agenda, available at AVeryHeavyAgenda.com, but also his work on American Anthrax, uh, a documentary that's available on YouTube. Robbie Martin, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you for having me, James. Well, as I say, we are going to be talking today about, well, we're going to be talking about the 2001 anthrax attacks. We have just entered the period of the 15th anniversary of those attacks. And in fact, as we're recording this, we have just passed the 15th anniversary of the shutdown, the unprecedented shutdown of the house that took place during those attacks, just one week before the passage of the Patriot Act, which of course was one of the major political events and the most obvious political fallout of that crazy time of the anthrax attacks. But it does strike me that now that we are 15 years on from those events, there are there is a significant section of the listening audience who either was not old enough to remember those events or potentially wasn't even born during them, let alone the people who were old enough to remember them, but don't, because this is a topic that was quickly swept under the rug. So why don't we just remind people a little bit about the, these attacks, the overview of them, and what uh, they ultimately ended up causing in terms of human life and uh, psychological damage? Well, yeah, I mean, so the the anthrax attacks themselves, I like to describe as almost like the second part of a larger, uh, like almost like a, a second stage of nine eleven, if you will, where I believe, and I and I have uh, recordings of neocons also echoing these same sentiments that w if nine eleven was an isolated incident, if we only had nine eleven and we didn't have the uh, the anthrax attacks immediately following. I believe we wouldn't have been able to get the momentum that the Bush administration needed and the sort of the public hysteria to push through the Iraq war and only, not only the Iraq war, but the Patriot Act, as you just mentioned, from the house being shut down um, and just the war on terror in general. The idea that terrorism was going to be an ongoing, continuing thing inside the United States, I think, was really all sort of solidified with the anthrax attacks. Now, we have recently talked on the Corbett Report to Gray McQueen about the investigation into those attacks and the various subjects that were floated and ultimately found not to have been responsible, and how, of course, suspicion did ultimately uh, quickly fall on the American government itself because the actual strain of anthrax used came from within the American biodefense defense sector. But interestingly... One of the first reports about the anthrax and its uh, provenance was uh, floated by ABC News, which claimed bentonite, bentonite, this substance which was indicative of uh, a Saddam Hussein Iraqi weapons of mass destruction uh, program uh, signature, as it were, in this anthrax. Now, that claim was made and almost immediately shot down by the White House um, by the end of October. The uh, White House spokesperson, uh, Ari Fle Fleischer, had come out to specifically deny that there was any trace of bentonite here. So it was quite quickly quashed. And yet, for some reason, the idea, the suggestion that Iraq had had something to do with this and Iraq was implicated by the, uh, the anthrax itself lingered and remained uh, for years, really. Um, let's talk about that process and some of the people who were behind pushing this idea that Iraq did have a role in this attack. Well, yeah, if I were going to name the people who pushed this the hardest, um, there were a few people in the mainstream news like uh, Brian Ross for ABC News. He did an entire special about it, TV report with scary B-roll of Iraqi, you know, uh, Ba'athist soldiers sort of marching and, and scary music. Um, but I believe sort of the weekly standard um, and sort of the project for the new American century, neoconservatives, were primarily behind constructing sort of this this propaganda to associate it with Iraq. Now, they were actually very careful in their own writings to not say that they had any proof that it was Iraq, 
but they were planting the seeds and hinting at it m- multiple times over the course of multiple months. And um, I believe this had a very strong effect on sort of the intellectual you know, class of Washington, D.C., where, as you said, the Bush administration quashed that idea of bentonite very quickly. But taking it back just to the very first anthrax um, death, Robert Stevens, on October 5th, the Bush administration oddly also went out and said, well, maybe he visited a farm. You know, we don't know, we don't know this is terrorism, even though there hadn't been a, an anthrax death in 25 years. Um, so it's, it, that part is a little bit strange to me, is why the Bush administration sort of took a back seat to this. But I believe that they, in some way, were instrumental in pushing this propaganda out there, maybe just in, in a way where it couldn't be tied directly to them. Um, and they had sort of their neocon friends who weren't inside the administration pushing these things. Now, the only, to me, one of the most extreme examples of this, though, is a reporter named Judith Miller, who I'm sure many people are familiar with, and, and Graham McQueen pointed me in the direction of a lot of bizarre connections um, to her and the anthrax attacks. She released a book on October 2nd called Germs, which uh, spends about one-third of the pages in the book discussing Iraq's biological weapons program and the possibility of an attack here uh, by an entity like al-Qaeda stealing biological weapons from a country like Iraq and using them to attack our population. Bentonite is also mentioned in her book as a characteristic of the Iraqi anthrax. Um, And even weirder, uh, uh, Judith Miller... Um, before 9-11, in June of 2001, was a volunteer in a bioweapons uh, terror drill called Operation Dark Winter that was put on in part by former CIA director James Woolsey. Um, and James Woolsey is also one of the main people going out there after 9-11, pushing the idea that Saddam Hussein was behind the anthrax, and, a, and Richard Pearl was as well. Um, they spoke at an American Enterprise Institute conference where... It's right after the, I believe, the Tom Daschle letter. And Richard Pearl is sitting there basically saying, look, you know, this is only a few letters, um, you know, only a little bit of anthrax. What if Saddam Hussein sent out tens of thousands of letters, you know, filled with the amount of anthrax that we know that he has? So they're already trying to, you know, they're pushing very hard for this idea. And actually a guy stands up in the audience and he kind of says, you know, after listening to you talk today, I wouldn't surprise me if this is sort of a Reichstag fire event that some right winger here in this country is actually behind. He wasn't referring to like a right wing super patriot, which is how people characterize Bruce Ivins. He was referring to neoconservative policymakers in D.C. that might have actually been behind it. So um, going back to Operation Dark Winter, though, uh, that's a very interesting drill because it had a script uh, that actually parallels very closely the anthrax attacks which followed a few months later. Um, They even recorded fake news broadcasts, which almost takes on this realm of almost more conspiracy lore. Um, You know, you hear about like them, you know, news broadcasts being staged a lot. Um, I usually don't pay attention to that kind of stuff. But in this case, they actually did record with actors fake news broadcasts that were used um, sort of only in the participants in the drill, shown to them. Um, Judith Miller played a reporter in the drill, so she's basically playing herself. James Woolsey played CIA director in the drill, which was his old position. And in one of these fake news broadcasts at the end, they say that, um, oh, and keep in mind, I I should have mentioned this, that it's not anthrax in Operation Dark Winter, it's smallpox. But in one of the last fake news broadcasts, the reporter says that, um, that somebody, a terrorist in Afghanistan, may have gotten a hold of this smallpox, um, and that uh, they might have gotten a hold of it from Iraq. Um, so I just think that's a very strange uh, coincidence that cannot be written off. And then in the end of the script for Operation Dark Winter, the participants, um, the very last stage of it was the terrorists were threatening, we have anthrax. And I believe almost using that exact phrase. Um, so that was sort of like in Operation Dark Winter, that was the next stage of the attack, you know, that this could happen next sort of thing. So let's talk about the the unfolding, because obviously this is in 2000, late 2001. By 2003, when the Iraq invasion was actually launched, it was not uh, a front and center in the 
consciousness of the American people at that point. Um, it had largely disappeared as a news story by that point. So how did this how did this momentum get maintained all the way up to 2003? And how did it get included in the speech that Colin Powell gave before the United Nations? That's a very good question. As best as I've been able to come up with, the momentum of in terms of the anthrax attacks um, didn't last the entire time between the, the time that they happened in, in the Iraq war. But I think that planting the seeds of that really helped make that case feel like a slam dunk to certain people who were watching it. Because if you think about all the other things that the Bush administration tried to prop up, this idea of uranium, uh, yellow cake uranium in, in Niger, the aluminum tubes, the fact that Saddam Hussein had a nuclear weapons program, the fact that Saddam Hussein was working with members of Al-Qaeda, none of those things actually had any sort of real-world impact um, in the sense that, you know, we didn't get nuked here, no terrorists were caught working with uh, uh, Iraq here or anything like that. That was all completely false. But what did happen here domestically was an anthrax attack, and that was sort of one of the wings of uh, a propaganda that the Bush administration was leaning on, that Saddam Hussein had this vast biological weapons program and these massive stockpiles of anthrax. So I believe just that it sort of sat with the public as this, you know, this actually happened here in this country. Um, it was a terrifying experience for many people, especially, you know, postal workers who had to handle mail. Two of them actually ended up dying uh, from anthrax infection. But Colin Powell, I think, was chosen because he was trustworthy to people. People who didn't trust Bush, you know, who maybe trusted Clinton, they trusted Colin Powell. Now, the weird thing to me about Colin Powell's speech is it was written by um, Lawrence Wilkerson. And Lawrence Wilkerson uh, recently did an interview with my sister, Abby Martin. And in the interview, she g gets to the anthrax question. You know, knowing what we know now, she asked him about anthrax, knowing that it came from Fort Detrick, Maryland. It's a bioweapons uh, lab, and it didn't come from terrorists. Do you sort of have any regrets? You know, he's already said he's regretted writing the speech, but do you have any more regret based on the fact that it, you know, wasn't even a real uh, attack from a terrorist or a Muslim or Arab terrorist, it was um, a bioweapons lab. And he has an extremely bizarre response where his whole demeanor changes and he tells her that that's not the case and she sort of needs to get her facts in order and that it was a terrorist. And the odd thing to me was either he's completely somehow ignorant on, on what happened um, or he knows something that he didn't want to talk about. And, and it's interesting, you watch the whole interview, his entire demeanor and friendliness sort of changes, and he is no longer friendly um, for the remainder of the interview. Something kind of got to him with that question. So I honestly, that's the best I can answer your question, because I'm not exactly sure how they're able to keep the momentum, but one thing that comes to mind is that there were a, a series of copycat anthrax letters that followed for many, many months uh, leading up to the Iraq war that were determined to not actually beat anthrax. They just had white powder. And Judith Miller uh, ended up getting one of those letters. Keith Oberman actually got one uh, sometime around 2006. And he was digging very hard into the anthrax attacks for a mainstream reporter. I would say deeper than probably anybody else in the mainstream. Um, uh, he was told not to speak about the event by the FBI until they could fully investigate what happened. But a few days later, the New York Post had all the details of what happened to him with the headline, Powder Proof Spe uh, Spooks Keith. Um, I don't know, you know, to me that means that the Bush administration wanted to make him look like a fool um, and embarrass him before he had even told anyone that he got sent a fake anthrax letter. Uh, the media obviously does play a large role in this, not only because of the way that they were complicit in the lead up to the war in Iraq, but in the way that the uh, the the anthrax story itself was covered. And you note, of course, uh, the the reporting ABC News and uh, and other outlets that, that really were pushing this Iraqi angle. But uh, the the way that the the story disappeared, I think, is another part of this: the fact that it wasn't followed up on. Um, can you speak to the the media silence and? Well, and, of course, the media targeting in the attacks themselves and how that might have played a role in, uh, in the silence that followed. Well, it's interesting. I've pondered this question a lot because 
as you said, it seems to have kind of disappeared. It doesn't seem that like any journalists out here in this country are that interested in digging deeper into the story. Um, and I think that the answer to that is pretty simple, although it's kind of a dark, uh, unpleasant answer, is that journalists were actually targeted and one of them was murdered with anthrax. Um, now, it might, it might have been a coincidence, but this journalist working for the Florida Sun is one of the only people that I know of to write a tabloid expose on the Bush daughters. Um, out of all the people in the country who have been targeted with weaponized anthrax, the first person in 25 years to die from it writes an embarrassing story with both of Bush's daughters humping each other on the ground at a drunken frat party. Um, so I believe that the anthrax attacks had a strong chilling effect on journalism in this country and politicians. Um, if you watch Tom Daschle and Patrick Leahy, two of the targets speak about the anthrax attacks, uh, they get emotional. And I don't mean they start crying or tearing up. Something is really, really bothers them about it still. And Patrick Leahy has actually said um, that he believes that the perpetrator is still out there and is guilty of murder. Um, and he's said these things at public hearings. I believe that was smart of him to say those kinds of things because, you know, there's this sort of fine line where if you stay silent, if you don't say anything, um, maybe you'll be targeted again. I mean, you know, getting sent a, a letter with a biological weapon is a very scary thing. Um, and so I think that it had a chilling effect on journalism in this country. Um, if you are curious about it, um, I think most people would probably listen to their own fear instinct and sort of realize that, well, maybe it's not a smart idea to dig too much into this story because some of the people, you know, were journalists who got targeted. Oh, and there's actually a funny kind of side angle to this is there were dozens of infections um, in the, the, the Senate building, um, dozens of infections at NBC News, the letter that was addressed to Tom Brokaw. But there was a fourth letter sent to the New York Post that only resulted in one infection. So I find that kind of interesting that, you know, what most people would describe as a neoconservative uh, outlet out of, running out of New York would only result in one infection from an anthrax letter. Very unusual. All right. Well, let's let's wrap things up by you telling us who actually did the attack. Um, <laughs> I will, maybe I won't uh, put you in that hot seat. But let's let's talk about where the investigation ultimately led, because of course the FBI officially concluded it was Bruce Ivins who conveniently died, and so everything is finished. Nothing had to go to trial. But as again, as we talked with uh, Graham McQueen about recently, uh, there was a whistleblower from within the investigation. In fact, the head of the anthrax investigation from the FBI, Richard Lambert, who recently filed a federal whistleblower lawsuit, basically saying that the FBI is intentionally is sitting on exculpatory evidence that would actually show that Ivan's or at the very least Ivan's may not have been responsible. Um, I'm not sure how far he goes in saying that exactly, but still. Clearly, um, there are there is a lot of uh, dissent even within the FBI about this um, the convenient frame up. Um, let's talk about the current state of the investigation and what what other pieces of evidence that we do have or do know about who ultimately actually did commit the attacks. Well, it ended. I mean, the official investigation pretty much ended with Bruce Ivins. Um, being the culprit. The FBI claimed it was a, uh, they had circumstantial evidence, enough of it to prove that he did it, um, which if you really comb over all the details, they don't. I mean, it's pretty, it's a pretty big reach that they're making, especially this idea that he was able to weaponize the anthrax on his off hours using lab time by himself, which is an extremely sophisticated process. Um, I've talked to Merrill Nass. Uh, someone else who's a bioweapons expert who's used to speak to Bruce Ivan, she said, you know, pretty much impossible. Um, so, I th and, and oh, and the National Academy of Sciences, who was commissioned by the FBI to verify their DNA investigation, said that it's pretty much bad, uh, bad information. It's not usable in the investigation. They claim that even the FBI's physical evidence is not proof. Um, but beyond that, uh, the investigation was dropped. I don't know if anything actually came out of that lawsuit that you're talking about. Um, Robert Stevens' wife ended up suing the U.S. government 
and settled for around $2.5 million for negligent homicide um, for she believed that the gov- after, she, after they pinned it on Bruce Ivan, she believed that the government should take responsibility for allowing an employee to send out a bioweapon. But in the, um, in the defense attorney for the U.S. government actually was trying to poke holes in the Bruce Ivins case as a means to, de- to defend against her claim, which, is, which Graham McQueen uh, brings up in his book as well. Um, but the only piece of new evidence uh, that I can speak about um, is something that was revealed by um, a whistleblower named Matt DeHart, um, who is now in a uh, Kansas jail cell. Um, he was arrested on something completely unrelated. Um, and I won't really speak on what you can look up to see what he was arrested for. Um, regardless of what he was arrested for, um, he makes some very believable claims that an FBI whistleblower, while he was, while he was basically collecting documents from whistleblowers, he worked as a, a drone intelligence analyst, um, that one of these documents that came in was a zip file from someone claiming to be an FBI whistleblower who was explaining in this primer that the documents contained in this zip um, prove that the anthrax somehow has CIA fingerprints behind it. Now, one of the more interesting things from that uh, set of documents that he claims that he got, the documents are seized by the U.S. government on a thumb drive. They've never been released. Um, But one of the interesting details from it that really made me more curious was that cobalt radiation is used to kill anthrax colonies. So if you wanted to study anthrax but not have live anthrax to study, common way to do this in a lab is to use cobalt radiation to make it inert. It, don't, it kills most of the spores, not 100% of them. But in these documents, it's claimed uh, the Nuclear Regulatory Commission was commissioned by the FBI to check out this radiation trail. And apparently, it does not lead to Fort Detrick, Maryland. So... Um, and in these documents, the FBI whistleblower was essentially saying it, ha- it has CIA fingerprints. I'm not certain if that means that it came from a CIA location. That I don't know. But interestingly, um, the person to quash this Nuclear Regulatory Commission investigation was Dick Cheney. Perhaps not surprising, but still very interesting. All right, there's so much more information that we could get into about this uh, attack and how it relates to the overall war of terror agenda. But of course, it still does have ramifications, if for nothing else than the fact that it helped in some way to justify the Iraq war to the American public. And of course, we still see the fighting going on in Iraq to this day. So obviously, there are still ongoing real world ramifications to this. And it is a giant at the very least, a giant question mark that hangs over the entire war on terror and its agenda and the Patriot Act itself that is steadfastly, uh, the the media steadfastly refuses to look into any further. So I think that should be a big red flashing warning sign that this is a very important ongoing story. You have a lot more to say about it in your work. Tell people a little bit about that work and how they can find it. Well, so I made um, American Anthrax a few years ago, which is kind of a short documentary. It's about 40 minutes, specifically all about the anthrax attack. It kind of chronologically takes you through the whole investigation using only raw footage and and the politicians in their own words. Um, When I investigated the anthrax attacks further, I started finding more connections to neoconservatives and just on based on a whole series of circumstances that happened to my sister working for Russia today, um, I decided to make a movie about the founders of the Project for the New American Century and sort of while making that movie, I found a lot of connections to them and the anthrax attacks and the anthrax propaganda. James Woolsey plays a role in the film. Um, the Kagan family, Robert Kagan, his wife Victoria Newland, Fred and Kim Kagan, um, Paul Wolfowitz, Bill Crystal. So it's kind of a, a, a documentary series about the neoconservatives starting the project for the new American century and sort of where are they now and what is their involvement in pushing us into this new cold war style footing. Um, and it's three parts. Uh, it's uh, seven and a half hours long in total. Um, and you could check it out at a very heavy agenda.com. Okay. The link will be in the show notes as always for people. And I suggest you do check it out, um, as well as American Anthrax. Robbie Martin, we're going to leave it there for today. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, James.
The Corbett Report is brought to you by The Corbett Report subscriber. A weekly newsletter featuring James Corbett's International Forecaster Editorial, recommended reading and viewing, discounts on Corbett Report DVDs, and once a month, a subscriber-only video. Sign up today to start receiving your copy at corbettreport.com support.